welcome to Mega Wellness Summit. I'm your host, Nikki Jensen. So, you know, I'm truly excited about our topic today. Dr. Isabella Wentz is in the house and is talking with us today about that little butterfly-shaped organ we have in our neck that has a powerful effect on our body. It's called the thyroid. Dr. Isabella Wentz is a pharmacist who has dedicated herself to addressing the root causes of autoimmune thyroid disease after being diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis in 2009. She's the author of the best-selling patient guide, Hashimoto's Thyroiditis, Lifestyles Interventions for Finding and Treating the Root Cause, and co-producer of Hashimoto's Institute. Welcome, Dr. Isabella Wentz. I'm so honored to talk to you. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here chatting with you. I'm, I'm really excited about our conversation today because there's so many people with thyroid issues now. If they don't know that they have a thyroid issue or they don't even know that the thyroid even exists, today they're going to be waking up to the fact that something might be going on with their thyroid that's the answer to their symptoms that maybe the doctor couldn't catch before. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's a very, very common condition, and not a lot of people know that they actually have thyroid problems. So I know I just mentioned, you know, where the thyroid is located and that it does regulate hormones. Really, the primary function of the thyroid is to regulate our metabolism in our body. Just about every cell has thyroid hormone receptors. So when we think about what the thyroid hormone does, is basically it helps us grow hair, helps us attract nutrients from our food, helps our Our skin turnover helps to heat up our body, helps to speed up metabolism. So some people have called the thyroid gland as the furnace of the body because it really helps with all aspects of metabolism and really keeping the body running. Now, you were diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis in 2009. Can you just share your story about all that? You know, Nikki, it was a it was a pretty long journey from the time I started having symptoms until I was diagnosed. Sometime around my freshman year of college, after I got a bout of uh, mono, which is caused by the Epstein Barr virus, which is actually a trigger for autoimmune thyroid disease, mm-hmm. I just never was myself again. So I used to be this very energetic, bright eyed, bushy tailed kid, and all of a sudden I was sleeping for 12 to 14 hours a night, and I was just exhausted all of the time. I found out I had mono, and, you know, even months after that went away, my fatigue just continued. So I became very, very keen of sleeping. I would sleep for 12 hours each night, and I got to be very productive in college and undergrad and in pharmacy school because I only had limited hours of being awake. Eventually, I started getting irritable bowel syndrome, Then a few years later, I started getting acid reflux. I started losing my hair and having carpal tunnel. And, you know, I had all of these weird little annoying symptoms that I was would go to doctors and they'd say, oh, you're fine, at least you don't have cancer, or, you know, like just kind of tell me that it's all in my head and and whatever when I was, you know, young. And eventually I was just, um, I was actually at a geriatrics conference when I was already, had been working as a pharmacist. And... We, they were talking about the thyroid gland at this conference, and, you know, it just kind of, I thought about it, and I was like, well, this kind of makes sense. I'm having a lot of these symptoms, and I was talking to some of these doctors around me, and, and I said, you know, this is how much I sleep and everything else, you know, this is what's happening. And, and you know, my doctor friends really encouraged me to, to get some more uh, comprehensive testing. So I went back, and I ended up getting my thyroid antibodies tested, and they were at a level of about 2,000 where okay. previously other doctors were just doing kind of a minimum testing and they were telling me that everything was fine. Some of them suggested that maybe I needed some antidepressants because, you know, well, if you're tired, then you probably need antidepressants. If you're anxious, you probably need antidepressants. So that was kind of my journey, and it took probably about eight or nine years for me to get diagnosed from the time that I started having symptoms of thyroid disease. Oh, my goodness. And antidepressants actually harm your thyroid, do they not? You know, there's a one medication known as lithium that can actually harm the thyroid, and that's used for bipolar disorder. The antidepressants, they definitely will mask the symptoms, but my biggest problem as a pharmacist is that they don't get to the root cause. So sure, mm-hmm. if you have a serotonin imbalance, the antidepressants might be helpful, but if you are tired or anxious because of a thyroid condition, 
taking antidepressants is not the right thing to do. Yeah, I would agree with that. First of all, one question. Hypothyroidism, can you explain what that is and what's the difference between hypo and hyper? Because I'm still confused on that. Yeah, that's a really great question. So when we think of um, hypothyroidism, basically it means a slowing of the thyroid activity. So this means that we don't have enough thyroid hormone in our bodies. And when I try to explain it to people, I, I have them think of, you know, really slowing things down in your body. So the symptoms you're going to see is you're going to be more tired, you're going to have brain fog or fatigue, you're not going to be very motivated, um, you're going to have a harder time burning fat, so you're going to be somebody that's going to be accumulating weight. This is very um, stressful to a lot of people. You're going to be losing your hair. You're going to have dry, dull skin because of the skin. It's not going to be turning over as quickly. People often have cold intolerance, which means that they, you know, if you're somebody that's living in Southern California and wearing a jacket in the summertime like I used to, that would be a good indication that your thyroid may be low. On the other hand is hyperthyroidism or an overactive thyroid. And this is actually, you know, I try to think about it as, as the body speeding up. So a person will often be anxious. They might have palpitations. They may be um, agitated. They're going to have, um, they're going to also be losing their hair because of greater turnover. They're going to be feeling hot. Their heart rate is going to go up and you might see increase in losing weight. So a person might be losing weight without trying. I've, you know, I've seen some people lose five to ten pounds within a few weeks just with not doing anything once they have the hyperthyroidism. Another thing is that I've seen many people who were unfortunately misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder or psychotic disorder or panic disorder when they had hyperthyroidism. And also, another thing to consider is Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland. You know, when that's been going on for a while, eventually that results in hypothyroidism or low thyroid. But in the beginning stages, people might have symptoms of both. So they might have the overactive thyroid symptoms with the anxiety and the palpitations and feeling really agitated, you know, even losing weight. Mm -hmm. And they also might have the other symptoms of the underactive thyroid, like having the brain fog and having, you know, constipation and being cold. So I, I've seen people, unfortunately, get diagnosed and misdiagnosed with, with mental illnesses when they actually had thyroid disease. I hope everybody just had an aha moment right there because how many antidepressants are being prescribed today and, you know, it seems like everyone I talk to has a mental health issue, right? And so I'm going, okay, well, it's one, probably your diet and, you know, trying to figure out what, like you say, like the root cause is of this depression or mental health trigger because we have so much going on with our food that's triggering the mental illness, right? But all along it could, could be your thyroid, and But isn't that kind of why this starts is because of the food, do you mm -hmm. think? Yeah, there are a lot of different triggers for, for thyroid disease. And definitely um, having a gluten sensitivity is going to be one of them. So a lot of times when people will be first diagnosed with a thyroid condition, one of the first interventions I'll recommend is going gluten-free. Some people can completely reverse their condition just by going, going gluten-free. I would say probably that's about 10% of the people. Other people, though, surveying my clients, about 80% of them actually feel much better by going gluten-free. Whether or not they completely recover from the thyroid condition, they definitely will feel better. So people that have celiac disease, is there a connection between celiac disease and Hashimoto's? Absolutely. So both conditions are autoimmune in nature. So that means that it's a, a case of the mistaken identity for the immune system. And in the case of celiac disease, the parts of the gut are attacked. In case of thyroid disease, the thyroid gland is attacked. There is some, there is definitely a connection and there are higher rates of thyroid disease, disease in people with celiac disease and vice versa. But there's also something known as gluten sensitivity, which is not necessarily celiac disease. Mm -hmm. It's basically just, you know, not the full-blown version, but somebody might still be sensitive to gluten. And people with Hashimoto's, most of them, I would say, 
Some of them have celiac disease. Most of them are going to be gluten sensitive. I've been off of gluten for about five years. And so I feel that my thyroid is not acting the way that it should be. So I'll give you my symptoms. I have weakness in my hands. I'm cold. I was experiencing a little bit of hair loss, but I didn't know if that was like due to the season. Tired, but not tired, but I still had energy, oddly enough, if that makes any sense. And then I... Tired but wired. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And then a bit of brain fog. So I started taking selenium. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I couldn't really lose weight, too. I'm, like, eating so clean but couldn't lose weight. So I I still haven't gotten tested. I haven't gotten tested on my thyroid, but I started taking selenium, and things started to pick up and seem like they were getting better. And then it seemed like things uh, tapered off again. And now the selenium really isn't working, so I stopped the selenium. My mother is the one who told me to take selenium. I don't even know why I would take it. Can you do you know why? Um, yeah, you've got a very smart mother. So one of the reasons that somebody might have autoimmune thyroid disease is, is due to nutrient deficiencies. And one of the very, very important nutrients in thyroid is selenium. So taking selenium has helped some people reduce the attack on their thyroid gland and reduce a lot of their symptoms, and some people can prevent the onset of the condition just by taking selenium. That can delay the onset by some significant amount of time. It is something I definitely recommend for people with mm-hmm. thyroid disease, but there's a multitude of other things that can be happening. So there may be other nutrient deficiencies. There may be other foods that a person is sensitive to. Other things that may be happening is if you've been under a lot of stress, you might have adrenal dysfunction. The adrenals and thyroid are very closely related. They have a very close communication system. So if you're under a lot of stress, your adrenals may tell your thyroid to slow down as well. A lot of the symptoms like feeling wired and tired, having a little bit of brain fog, inability to lose weight, being a little cold, are actually could be due to the adrenals as well as the thyroid. So for somebody Like you who's experiencing all those things, I would recommend definitely doing thyroid testing, so doing your TSH, your TPO antibodies, and thyroglobulin antibodies just to make sure there's no autoimmune attack on the thyroid and that there's enough thyroid hormone on board. And the other thing would be looking at doing an adrenal saliva test, so to determine if maybe something is happening with your adrenals that could be weighing down your thyroid gland. Now, do regular doctors and not functional medicine doctors, do regular doctors test for this? Because if somebody's out there going, okay, I want to go to my regular doctor and make sure this is covered by my insurance, you know, how does somebody go about that? So definitely the thyroid testing, so the um, TPO antibodies, thyroglobulin antibodies, you can abbreviate them as TPO and TG, Mm -hmm. um, and TSH will be done by most primary care doctors. They should not have a problem running those tests if you ask for them. Where it gets a little bit more tricky is asking for free T3 and free T4, which okay. measure the active hormones of active thyroid hormones in your body. And then also doing something like reverse T3 may be helpful too. And the reverse T3 basically tells us if our body is is converting our thyroid hormone correctly. So in some cases when you're stressed out and you have a nutrient deficiency your body may be producing what I call the dummy version of thyroid hormone, which basically, instead of speeding up the body, it slows it down. Now, the other part of the testing, the adrenal saliva test, that would be something that would need to be done by uh, either a functional medicine doctor or you can order that by yourself online. The adrenal saliva test actually depends on which company that you go through. So some of the companies will actually give you a breakdown and they'll tell you exactly what the test means. Other companies, you know, they might just give you a chart back with some numbers that you might look at and say, like, okay, what is what does that mean? So I definitely recommend working with somebody who is experienced in, in understanding adrenal function. You know, what companies out there are doing saliva testing? You can do, um, if you go to directlabs.com, MyMedLab or ZRTLab.com, those are going to be some ways to get different types of labs without a doctor's prescription.
I know that I'll be doing that for sure, and I hope that people listening to this will get on board and start taking action for themselves. So that's perfect. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Hashimoto's, is this forever? Can you get rid of it? You know, it's something that you need to have three things in order for it to manifest. You need to have the right genetic predisposition. You need to have the triggers on board. So we talked about some of the triggers being different foods or nutrient deficiencies. And the third part is, and this is recent research from a gastroenterologist out on the East Coast, Dr. Alessio Fasano, that talked about intestinal permeability Mm -hmm. that is present in everybody with autoimmune disease. And what he's been able to find is if you turn off the intestinal permeability or you eliminate the triggers, then the autoimmune condition goes into remission. So, you know, it's something that if you get re-triggered, let's say an infection or a specific food caused your autoimmune condition, if you get that infection again to eat that food or if you, you know, become deficient in that same nutrient again, you might develop the condition again. But, you know, it is possible to keep it into remission where you don't have any symptoms, the attack goes away. Um, In some cases, some people can even get off of medications. So intestinal permeability, a.k.a., leaky gut that are caused by primarily food and medication? Um, so there's a lot of different causes. One of the first ones I look, I talk about exploring is actually gluten. So okay. when I was, um, at the time I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, uh, my husband and I were very much into conventional medicine, and I was working as a pharmacist. He was a financial advisor. He covered stocks for a lot of pharmaceutical companies, and I was not very into natural medicine or changing my diet. It just, you know, I didn't think any of that really mattered. So Mm -hmm. what I ended up doing is I ended up going to PubMed and looking at different research as, you know, any kind of new research about how to help the condition that I had. And I came across some information about gluten. And research talked about how people who went on a gluten-free diet and had celiac disease and thyroid disease, they were able to put their thyroid disease into remission just by going on this diet. And, you know, this was about 20% of the people, but this was very exciting to me because it was the first sign that food actually mattered. And gluten is one of those things that causes intestinal permeability or leaky gut in just about everybody. So one of the first things I'll recommend for people if they have an autoimmune condition, if they have a thyroid condition, and just for the listeners at home, if you take thyroid medications, if you've been told that you have a sluggish thyroid there's probably a 90% chance that it's autoimmune in nature. Your doctor just might not tell you because, you know, conventional medicine doesn't really have an answer for whether it's autoimmune or whether it's, you know, your thyroid disappeared overnight due to magic. They'll put you on medications for for both conditions. So basically going the gluten-free route is one of the most helpful things you can do if you have an autoimmune condition. You know, that just proves to people how dangerous this grain really is and how much damage it's doing to our entire lives. People go, well, there's always a symptom that they're overlooking that is totally associated with gluten. So I'm glad that you're saying that if you omit this horrendous grain, which is wheat, barley, rye, spelt, right, so that all contains gluten, and you can start to heal. And I'm sure other with other things, get rid of sugar and process junk as well. So very cool. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Definitely. In thyroid patients, gluten, dairy, and soy have been some of the biggest triggers. Some people, though, they might be really sensitive and they may need to go on an elimination diet where they mm-hmm. cut out different foods and then try to work out what's causing their gut to be leaky. It can right. be... It can definitely be foods. In some cases, it can be medications, like you said. It could be exposure to toxins, having too much stress, or having, you know, an imbalance of gut bacteria. So if you don't have enough probiotics on board, that can be an issue. And in some people, they actually have infections in their guts that need to be cleared out before their gut no longer becomes leaky. Interesting. Besides omitting food, is there anything that you can do, and I guess besides taking probiotics, anything you can do to seal up those holes and to heal your gut? You know, definitely going on a clean diet is going to be the first step. If that hasn't been 
your solution within three months, then I would look at testing, working with a functional medicine doctor to see if you might have some gut infections that could be tearing up more holes in the gut. So that's something I recommend. There are different things you can do. You can take bone broth is excellent for healing the gut. Taking a supplement called L-glutamine or taking probiotics are some of the very helpful things people can do. I've been talking with many experts, and that's the same thing keeps coming up, bone broth, bone broth, bone broth. So I love that. I drink bone broth uh, all the time and make it, so I love it. So a lot of people are going to be questioning, isn't this genetic? Aren't I going to get it anyways? And it has nothing really to do with our diet because the doctor told me that. You know, absolutely. And that's kind of the old school way of thinking. But when you look at the, it's called the concordance rate in twins, where basically if you have two identical twins, you would expect that they have identical genes. But, you know, so if a condition was purely genetic, both of the twins would develop Hashimoto's, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not the case. Only half of the twins develop Hashimoto's. So the other half comes from the environment and the triggers, you know, different stressful events, maybe infections or different foods that they eat. So I would look at uh, your genes as not your destiny, but kind of as a roadmap that you can really look at and tailor and, you know, kind of kind of know what's coming up ahead and, and know that you can do things to to change that. Fantastic. I believe that we were designed perfectly. We come out into this world and we're a perfect being with good healthy cells and we're brand spanking new. I think what it really is, what we're putting into our body that is bad, that could potentially be turning on these genes. You know, absolutely. And of course, not everybody is genetically blessed. Some people might have genetic disorders that are very rare in nature. Um, But with a lot of these things, especially autoimmunity, it seems to be that the genes have been in place for a very long time. Mm. Um, I kind of like to think of them as our signals for when there's danger ahead. So back in during the potato famine, more people who had hypothyroidism survived because the hypothyroidism slowed them down and they didn't need as many calories. They were keeping their weight on despite not having a lot of food available to them. So it's almost like a body's survival mechanism. And when the body senses danger, whether that's through, you know, having toxic foods, toxic infections, you know, toxins in our air or environment, the body is going to try to figure out a way to survive. And if surviving means let's slow down the thyroid gland, let's hold on to this fat, let's, you know, not put energy into having nice hair, the body's going to do that. And so I think of it as, basically our adaptive physiology to what's going on in in our outside world. I used to work with a woman who has Hashimoto's, and the first thing that her doctor did was radiate the thyroid. And they used that as a method of healing, the thyroid. But radiation is extremely bad for you. So why would that heal the thyroid? So did she have radioactive iodine or... I believe so. Yeah, so in some cases, when people have an overactive thyroid, the doctor may recommend doing that treatment, and that usually actually kills off the thyroid gland, so then the person's thyroid is no longer overactive, and then the person gets put on thyroid medication. And I'm not sure what the case was with your client, but generally that's, you know, how radioactive treatment works. Do you think that that's a a good source of a treatment? So if if you're diagnosed with Hashimoto's, do you feel that that's a good viable treatment or a good route to go? Usually that's not the recommended treatment for Hashimoto's. Usually it's recommended for Graves. And I would say, you know, something like that would be more of a last resort for me if um, I would first try doing lifestyle interventions and then I would try medications. And at that point, if, you know, if nothing was working, then I would probably think about doing something like that just because it's not reversible where medications and lifestyle changes, you can play around with them. It's not permanent. Okay. And can you explain Graves' disease? Graves' disease is basically an overactive thyroid. So when we talked about the two different pendulums with the underactive, Um, Graves' disease is when there's an autoimmune attack. The part of the thyroid gland that tells the thyroid gland to stop making hormones, 
So there's just this uncontrolled making of thyroid hormone, and it can be very dangerous. So people who can have um, problems with their heart, they can have really bad bone turnover, they can feel almost manic and agitated. They might have, you know, palpitations, problems with fertility, a lot of different symptoms and a lot of um, very unpleasant feelings and potentially dangerous. And this is something that is not as common as Hashimoto's, but often has very similar underlying root causes. So, you know, I'll have clients who maybe have that and they'll go gluten-free and that'll really help. Um, The thing with Graves' disease is it often goes into remission, even just with doing medications. Um, I will often actually recommend doing all the lifestyle interventions in addition to the medications before I would recommend doing something like the radioactive iodine. Unfortunately, for many doctors, that's the first thing they'll recommend. And to me, that's kind of like permanent solution to a temporary problem. As most medications in my mind are. What medications do you recommend for that? For Graves' disease? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, there's different medications that suppress the thyroid gland, and I would encourage people to work with their physicians on that. But there's also, and they can be toxic, um, but they are sometimes necessary. Methimazole is one of them. What I would actually recommend, which is an off-label use, so this is not something, it doesn't have FDA approval for this condition, is a medication known as low-dose naltrexone. And it's a compounded version of a medication that's currently out there that's used for a lot of all things opiate addiction. But okay. in very low doses of the medication, uh, like 1.5 to maybe 4.5 milligrams, the medication seems to have stabilizing effects on the immune system. And taking that medication can help with putting Graves' disease and Hashimoto's into remission without having the toxic side effects of some of the other thyroid-suppressing medications. Fantastic. And can you spell that for us just so that people can write that down? Um, Sure. It's basically if they want to look up LDN, that's an abbreviation for the medication, and also low-dose, naltrexone, it's N-A-L-T-R-E-X-O-N-E. And if they look LDN, a lot of times they'll find content just about that. They they can search for LDN and Graves' disease, LDN and Hashimoto's, LDN and, you know, different kind of autoimmune conditions. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. And so what do you think about iodine? We hear that there's you know, a huge iodine deficiency in our diets. How does iodine play a role in all of this? You know, iodine is a very controversial subject in the thyroid world. So, um They've done some studies in countries before um, they started adding iodine to the cell supply. And so worldwide, the number one reason for hypothyroidism is due to iodine deficiency, not having enough iodine on board. But public health officials started adding iodine to the cell supply in order to counteract that. And, you know, this seemed like a really, really great idea because now we don't have very many cases of iodine-induced hypothyroidism. But what's been happening is actually having too much iodine can actually trigger Hashimoto's and Graves' disease. So it's kind of like, you know, a Goldilocks supplement where you don't want too little and you don't want too much of it. Right. Um, One study done in Iran found that the rates of Hashimoto's quadrupled within 10 years of adding iodine to the salt supply. So for me, it's something that, you know, there are some people out there that have had miracle stories of of going on really high doses of iodine, and a lot of their symptoms got better. And, you know, I'm very happy for those people, but I'm also very cautious with recommending iodine for everybody because not everybody is deficient. And then mm-hmm. some people, especially the ones with Hashimoto's, they can actually make the condition and Graves' disease far more worse. So I know in Hashimoto's, I've seen some clients had an increased attack on their thyroid gland, So the iodine was like pouring more gasoline on a fire that was happening in their thyroid. And they, you know, I've seen people who were bedridden as a result of taking these really high doses. You know, something, the iodine that's in like a multivitamin or a prenatal vitamin, usually those amounts are okay for most people, even if they have Hashimoto's. But I would be very cautious of, you know, going on these super high doses that some people recommend just because, you know, it's a very, very individual thing. And one person 
may feel amazing on it. Another person may be really hurt by it. So I actually treat it like a drug, and mm-hmm. I'm very careful with recommending it. And, you know, I want to make sure that people, it's not something people just do on their own. If they have thyroid disease, they would need to work with a practitioner who specializes in it and, you know, do the testing to make sure that this is actually an issue for you or do an assessment of how much iodine you get on a daily basis. Anything, everything has a dose response and you don't want to take too much of a good thing for sure. I recommend doing a test called uh, by the, my spectrocell labs or I recommend one by ZRT lab called the um, elements profile and that basically you know, that kind of does an assessment for you of your iodine intake on an average day. Can you repeat that for people just so that they can, if they didn't write that down? Spectrocell Lab as well as ZRT Lab Elements Profile. Perfect. Thank you. And what do you think about supplements? Some of the supplements that I found to be very helpful are going to be selenium, like we talked about. Um, Another one that I I found to be very, very helpful in people with, with thyroid disease is not a lot of people know this, but basically, you know, when I used to work as a pharmacist, I would often dispense acid reflux medications like like Nexium or Prilosec along okay. with thyroid medications. And a lot of people with thyroid conditions get misdiagnosed with acid reflux when, in fact, studies have shown that people with thyroid disorders actually have low amount, amounts of stomach acid. So taking a stomach acid supplement can actually help a lot of the symptoms. Um, I know personally I took one named as betaine with pepsin, and it was almost like overnight when I got to the right dosage that I felt I had a lot more energy. So I went from sleeping maybe 10, 11 hours a night to sleeping to 8 hours a night because I was finally digesting my foods. And this yeah. is um supplement called, known as betaine with pepsin. It's taking with, taken with protein-containing meals. Okay. I have directions on how to take the supplement in my digestion and depletion chapter of my book. If you guys want to go to thyroidpharmacist.com slash gift, you can download that chapter for free because it's kind of complicated on how you should take it, so I, I don't want to open up something and, and leave people without getting the full directions. Thank you. Oh, my gosh, people are going to love that. We love free gifts. Thank you. So that's awesome. And are there any other supplements besides that? What about zinc boosting your immune system or... Yeah, definitely zinc is one of the ones I recommend. And, you know, I I try not to willy-nilly recommend different supplements. I want to make sure the person either has some testing done or does an assessment of their own health. One of the big ones that's missing in thyroid disease is going to be vitamin D, so making sure that you have enough vitamin, vitamin D on board. Another deficiency is very common. It's going to be in the B vitamins, especially the B12 vitamin. I recommend a supplement known as methylcobalamin. Um, mm-hmm. Another common nutrient deficiency is going to be an iron deficiency. One of the best ways to test for it is with your traditional doctor is a test known as ferritin. And, okay. you know, taking a supplement for that may be very helpful, and that helps with thyroid conversion, that helps with hair loss and energy levels. And I have a lot of different supplements on my website, and by no means do I recommend everybody take all of them. I have the digestion and depletions chapter of my book that you guys can get for free kind of goes over all of the different common nutrient deficiencies in thyroid disease and how to figure out which ones you might have by symptoms and testing and the recommended supplements just because it can be very, you know, you don't want to take a whole bunch of stuff because sometimes different things compete with one another. For example, if you take um, zinc that may deplete your copper levels, so you always want to make sure you're balancing oh things gosh. properly. I'm so grateful that you're talking about this because just right there, I mean, this is a very complicated subject, the thyroid. It, it's so complicated to understand. I think a lot of medical doctors or family physicians don't understand it themselves, and I know that I have a hard time wrapping my brain around the thyroid, so I can't really... I can't even tell people really where to go or what to do. I just know about T3, T4 testing and very minimal, you know, things to do to help your thyroid or support the thyroid gland. Now, I really am so grateful that you have come on Mega Wellness Summit and just gave people a whole slew of things they can do to improve their thyroid. 
and do it naturally. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also, um, for people with an underactive thyroid, there are also medications they can take, and there are natural thyroid medications that sometimes may be more effective and more helpful than the synthetic medications, too. I think when you can go natural at any time, you should. I know that people have a hard time changing their lifestyle or changing their diet, but it's absolutely imperative that people start waking up to this fact that we're poisoning ourselves and poisoning our organs, endocrine system, uh, that's so vital to our life that we should definitely take a look at what we're eating first and putting into our body that is supposed to be fueling us when it's actually could be killing us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, start with what you put in your body. So going on a nutrient-dense, clean diet is one of the best things you can do for yourself, for, for your current health, for your future health, you know, for the health of your children. I would really just start at getting your book because that's a whole slew of answers right there at your fingertips, and then you can go from there. First of all, everybody should go to www.thyroidlifestyle.com, check out Isabella's blog, and connect with her on Facebook, and then get her book, Hashimoto's Thyroiditis Lifestyle Intervention for Finding and Treating the Root Cause. I love it. I love all of it. When you come down to it, it's the root cause. Yeah, absolutely, and there's so many things that people can do to help themselves. So thank you for putting on this summit because I think you're really giving people a tremendous opportunity to to be their own health advocates and to take charge of their own health. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, I'm so grateful, and I'm really honored that you're on the summit and I got to talk with you because – Really, you have changed so many lives, including my own and my mother's life. I mean, just your book alone was so powerful and really opened our eyes to what's really going on with our health. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's been a pleasure.